Today's Supreme Court ruling has such wide ranging implications for every single state. So I thought it was important to give us some context to understand what is really happening, what our new reality looks like. So I invited a constitutional law scholar and professor at the University of San Diego, Professor Miranda McCowan, who is here. Hello, how are you, Professor? Hi, Lisa, Thank Hi. I'm well. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate your time on this big, very important day. Um, I wanna start with the sort of implications of overturning a precedent that has been on the books in this country since 1973, overturning Roe versus Wade. Tell me what the magnitude of that is in the legal world. This is an earthquake. Um, and I think even more than an earthquake, it is a challenge being thrown down by this majority, this conservative majority of the Supreme Court. They are saying we are not afraid to remake constitutional law in and put our stamp on it. What does, I mean, we're talking about precedent, right? So this idea of stare decisis, I think a lot of people probably heard that term for the first time today. So explain to people what stare decisis is. So the Supreme Court traditionally leaves a decision in place. Why? Because of this concept of the rule of law, which is something that uh, Justice Alito talks a lot about in the Dobbs decision. And the idea behind the rule of law is, is that we in America are ruled by law and not by people. Now, clearly, when the Supreme Court hands down a decision, it's lost on no one that there are nine people handing down a decision, right? right? So in order to make it more than about the justices, once a case is decided, it stays decided. So when new justices come on, they don't make a difference in rewriting what has already been decided. And there are some other values to that too. Predictability. Notice about what our rights are. Because in order for us to be able to fully exercise our liberties in the United States, which is really our core value. To exercise our liberty in the United States, we need to know what the law demands of us. And if the law is changing all the time, then that in and of itself constricts our ability, limits our ability to exercise our liberty. Right, so that means and correct me if I'm wrong, but that means this Dobbs decision today on abortion is setting a brand new precedent, right? Is that what that is that it what's happening? Absolutely is. It is. What does that mean? So for precedent. people that are waking up today, right? What is the difference from when they woke up yesterday in terms of this precedent? So it means that this Supreme Court has said that the Constitution does not protect a woman's right to have an abortion at any point in her pregnancy, at any point in her pregnancy. And it doesn't say whether there are any limits on that. For example, it, it appears to say that if a woman's life is at risk, then there may be some right for her to have an abortion, but it's unclear whether what at what point, and this is a point the dissent makes, at what point we can say that someone's life is actually at risk. So it is very unclear at this point to what extent women will have to be forced to endure risky pregnancies because a state is not permitting them to get an abortion. We're going to talk about state laws in just a second, but before I move off of this, what's different today versus yesterday, I just want to make it very clear mm -hmm. that the court in Dobbs is not saying abortion is banned across no, the country. No, not saying that at all. Okay. They are saying states may now restrict abortion. If okay. states want to pass laws banning abortion, which many states have already, mm -hmm. 
right. or have these zombie laws that have been, you know, in deep freeze waiting for Roe to be overruled, which it was today, and then suddenly come back to life, right? We've got over a dozen of those that just I mean, come back to life, right? So between the zombie laws and the and the trigger laws, we're talking right. about half of the country at this point. Is that fair to say? Yeah, at least 26 states that are on the cusp of, if not banning abortion outright, significantly restricting it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's what's wanna... different about today. No state has to ban abortion, but if you are a state that wants to ban abortion, you now can. Right. Um, I want to talk about this majority opinion because Justice Alito talks about something that I fe- it struck me as very interesting which is this idea of due process. Mm-hmm. And the, you mentioned it at the beginning that this opinion said that abortion was not basically enshrined in the constitution. It is not, an, it is not in any amendment. The word doesn't appear mm-hmm. anymore. But since Roe, we have sort of assumed it to be a constitutional right in this country because of Roe. Um, but now today he's sort of putting a new spin on what we can consider as a right that we just, that's not enshrined in the constitution, but we use it as a right in this country. That's right. Yeah, he significantly narrowed what could be defined as a constitutionally protected right. But you're right. I mean, that's basically the way things work under constitutional law. We have specific enumerated rights in the Bill of Rights, and those apply to not only the federal government, but to states because of the 14th Amendment's due process clause. No state shall deny to any person life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so when we're talking about enumerated rights, we're talking about stuff like free speech, freedom of religion, the right to be the Fourth Amendment right to be free from searches and seizures, the Fifth Amendment right. Um, Here's one that's very relevant to the judiciary hearings lately, the right to be free from self incrimination. Right. right? So those are enumerated rights. But a lot of the rights that we really care about are nowhere mentioned in the Constitution, the right to use contraception, the right to intimate sexual contact in your house, the right to marry, the right to make decisions about how to raise your children. Nowhere are those rights enumerated in the Constitution, spelled out in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And instead, the Supreme Court has inferred them as being fundamental to the concept of liberty, fundamental the concept of liberty. So does that mean, let's just, I mean, I don't want to blow out of proportion Dobbs because, I mean, Justice Alito very specifically in Dobbs, I wrote it down, said this decision concerns the right to abortion and no other right. He was very specific about that. However, there is a concurring opinion from Justice Thomas that sort of calls into question some of those other types of rights that are not in the Constitution. You just mentioned some of them. They were in um, uh, 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 Obergefell, Lawrence, uh, Griswold, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The right of married people to get contraceptives, the same-sex marriage, the right to engage in private consensual sex. He's talking about, Justice Thomas is talking about possibly revisiting all of that based on the justification that is being used today. How likely is that? So Justice Thomas is a really rare bird. He's one of these justices who believes that the original meaning of the Constitution trumps all other considerations. So he doesn't actually care about precedent. If precedent is wrong, in light of the original meaning of the Constitution, then it doesn't bind the justices. Because the original meaning of the Constitution 
is the law and it is the thing that binds all of us. That is really controversial. Most yeah. originalists care about precedent. They're, they at least care enough about precedent to, as Justice Alito did, spend pages and pages and pages justifying overruling it and will generally uphold precedents that they're on the fence about. Right. Okay. Or like that when in question, let's stick with the precedent so we don't up, upset what's going on, except right. for in this case. Right. And Justice Thomas doesn't consider precedent to be a reason to rule one way or the other. So how likely it's very unusual. Okay. okay. And, and he's the only one in the court that signed on to this concurring That's sort of right. opinion. Right. So the so the question is, is does it open the door for other lawsuits about these specific things yes. to sort of start to make their way through the courts in the off chance that maybe another justice or two will come onto this court and perhaps side with Thomas? Is that possible? Well, I mean, I suppose that is possible. Um, I think that those lawsuits are coming. My, my approach is always, can I count to five, right? Can I count to five and see if there are five votes for any particular position? Now, I think if we used this very narrow history and tradition approach to figuring right. out whether some unenumerated right is protected by the Constitution that Alito uses, if we use that very narrow test, there's no right to same-sex marriage. Frankly, there's no right to use contraception. There's right. no right to do anything but the missionary position when you are married, um, period, right? right? Those were anything but, none of those rights exist. Right. Okay. So it would seem that if you're a state and you want to ban contraception or I think probably more predictably want to ban same sex marriage. Right. You're going to pass a law tomorrow and then you're going to bring a suit. So at the same time, I don't think you you can count to five on that. OK. Okay. And that is why Justice Kavanaugh concurred as opposed to join as a pro, as opposed to joining the opinion. Right. And why Justice Chief Justice Roberts only did something what we call concurring in the judgment as opposed to joining the opinion or concurring in the opinion. Right. And that and that's because both of them are not interested in revisiting Griswold or the contraception case that applies to unmarried people or right. same sex marriage or intimate conduct in the bedroom. They're not interested in that. Right. So we can't count to five, as you we said, on those five. things today at this point. We can't count to five today. Got it. Um, I want to know. I mean, if the election goes a different way in 2024, right, then you very well could count to five. Got it. Um, we did mention a little bit about states because now this is abortion right. case. All of these abortion cases and the, the ideas of the abortion and the restrictions on abortions or the, the opening up of abortion is now in the hands of states. And I am wondering, by law, how far can they go? I think that it's unclear to what extent states would have to carve out exceptions for the health of a woman and whether they would be able to say only the life and not the health. Some states, for example, today say that for their health exceptions, there has to be a danger to a woman's major bodily functions to fall into a health exception. Um, it's also unclear whether states could ban abortion for rape or incest. So the dissent says, you know, that the majority keeps saying we want to overrule Roe, we want to overrule Casey because we want certainty. The dissent says there's no certainty because now we have all of these open issues. 
what constitutes a threat to a woman's life? What about rape and incest? What about health risks? Right. Now, since you are also an expert sort of in le legislative things, I am wondering, can Congress do anything that would not be automatically disqualified based on this ruling? Oh, Congress could do whatever it wanted. Tomorrow, uh, Congress could pass a law that required access to abortion in every state of the United States. The Congress can regulate abortion and provide for the legality of abortion, no question. Obviously, they're not going to do that. But there is nothing in the Constitution that would prevent them from doing that. And there's and nothing if, in this decision that would prevent them from doing that. And if they did, then I'm sure multiple states would sue. It would come right back to this court and we would probably end up with the same decision or no? No, I don't think so, because then it would come down to an issue of congressional power. And okay. Congress has pretty wide ranging authority to regulate what we call interstate commerce and abortion, procuring an abortion, paying for an abortion, crossing state lines to get an abortion, that all falls into a pretty traditional notion of interstate commerce. Got it. Speaking of interstate commerce, uh, the president made a yes. comment today, the attorney general then backed up that comment today where the president said he is going to use the full power of the administration and the Department of Justice to protect a woman's right to travel from state to state. Perhaps if her state has a ban of, of abortion bad, she may travel to another state to get that abortion. Or a woman who is getting an abortion pill through the mail, he and the Department of Justice are going to do what they can with the full power of the government to protect that. Can that actually happen? So I do think that there is a constitutional right to travel and that that right would prohibit states from prosecuting a woman in say Indiana or Ohio who traveled to Illinois in order to get an abortion. Okay. If a crime doesn't happen in a state, states can't prosecute it. States only have jurisdiction, the ability to prosecute people for stuff that happens within the state. They but don't have the power to reach into other states and say, Illinois, no, what, what happened in your state is a crime in ours, so we're going to reach over and grab that person and prosecute them in our state. That, 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 that's not permitted. But how could that be? There's a bunch of states that are right now passing laws, in essence, that would do such a thing. Well, I mean, states, so states are testing the boundaries of this, right? Yeah. States, states have been testing the boundaries of Roe since, you know, since the 1980s. Right. Um, since before the 1980s. <laughs> and so states are going to be trying to regulate abortion to the fullest extent possible and then sue to see whether that will be permissible. So Lisa, I think the other thing is, is that, you know, you and I may be reading Supreme Court opinions. And so we hear that there's a right to travel and that it's not permissible for Texas to prosecute someone who goes to New Mexico. But if you are a woman in Texas, do you know that Texas's law that bans you from crossing state lines is unconstitutional? I don't know, right? Maybe not. In which case, Texas's law works on you, whether it's constitutional or not. An interesting point. It's certainly an interesting point. And it Quite frankly, that point could go towards a lot of things in yeah. this country, yeah. right? Um, the last thing I want to talk about, um, speaking of women, um, is a, a line that Justice Alito wrote in his majority opinion that I thought was very interesting when he said, um, this ruling, women, because of this ru ruling, women don't lack the electoral or political power. And basically, if they don't like this ruling, they have other remedies. Right. What are those other remedies? Well, I think this comes back to the fact that today, 
Today's opinion does not make any state ban abortion. States can or cannot permit abortion. It's, up to, it's at the state level. And women are the majority of voters. More women than men vote. Women tend to be more politically active than men. And so if women do not want abortion to be banned in their states, Alito's, Alito's point is, is that they should go make their voices heard and get yeah. abortion permitted in that state. So that's looking at the voter level. Women don't have the same political power in local government or in state government, and certainly in the federal government in terms of holding office. It's Absolutely. actually getting more even in local and state government, but it's still not 50-50. And one of the things that we saw happen when women started serving as representatives was that laws changed. Women made a difference. And so women may vote, but if they don't actually have women representatives, they may not have the power that Justice Alito says that they have. Can I talk about one other thing? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So one of the most disturbing things about this very narrow history and tradition approach that looks to see what the original meaning of the Constitution was in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified is the fact that it is looking at a history and tradition of rights that only white men had any say in making. Women didn't have the right to vote until 1920, 60 years after, 50 years after the 14th Amendment was ratified. Black men didn't get the right to vote until 1870. At the time the Constitution was originally framed, only white men with property had the right to vote. So if you're looking at whether our history and tradition has historically protected the right to abortion, of course you're not going to find anything there because right. no one was making laws in the interest of women in particular. They had no ability to fight for rights that mattered to them. And it wasn't just women, right? Like you're saying, it was right. everybody other than white men. That's right? exactly who had, right. Who owned, who owned property. Let's start there. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so moving forward, what is the next step, right? So the Supreme Court now term is over. Now they come back in October. So does this leave sort of chaos in the, in the states? Well, I think we're gonna have to see what states do tomorrow and the next day, right? We already know that there are a bunch of states that have already like Oklahoma have already just banned abortion. They just knew we did it. Then there are a bunch of states that have trigger laws then there are some other states where they may significantly restrict abortion. They may significantly restrict abortion. Um, and so I think it's going to be very fluid over the next few months. It appears to me, however, that unless you live in one of 21 states that ask the Supreme Court not to overrule Roe, you're in jeopardy of not being able to exercise the, the right to have an abortion and that you'll have to travel state lines in order to get one. All right, it is a consequential day and I so appreciate your time and your expertise in helping us understand what happened, Professor McGowan. It's so nice to see you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me.